Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. <laughs> uh, good afternoon again to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, my apologies for the chaos generated last couple of times. I was really looking forward to give uh, this presentation. Uh, from what I have seen in previous uh, meetings, I know that I will be the main beneficiary of this session. So once again, thank you. Thank you very much for being here today. And can you hear me right? Well, right? Sure. Okay. So um, a little warning before starting. So this is my first presentation entirely in English. And it, is a quite, and it is quite a long one, so I'm a little nervous. Therefore, my apologies in advance uh, for any language mistake that I could commit. If at any point my expressions are not clear enough, please do not hesitate uh, to stop me so I can reformulate my idea with more accuracy, or at least try to do so, OK? <laughs> so um, I don't know if I can share my, my PowerPoint or Uh, how do I? So if your screen looks like mine, there's a green button at the bottom that so shows share screen. Not yet, but I, I cannot. I mean, I'm not able to. I don't no. have the permissions required to share. Oh, I see. <laughs> Sorry, Rose, you need to make Rodrigo the host, right? There is. Thank you. Okay, uh, do you see all my presentation? Not yet. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Yep. No. Okay. <laughs> well, today I will be talking about Erigenes' eschatology, in particular about his doctrine of apocatastasis and his relationship with the theory of causes and theories. Um, so uh, the relevance of eschatological matters in the thought of John Scotus Erugina in general is widely recognized. Um, Bernard McGee noticed that eschatology can be understood in two ways, namely as the last events of history or as the events that are way after history. So it is, this, it is from this last perspective, especially, that we could affirm that Erugina um, uh, develops a monumental and impressive eschatology. In fact, um, sorry. In fact, his ideas regarding those events that will take place after history are so important to him that they will occupy a third of his masterpiece, uh, the Perifician. Uh, moreover, Erugian's Perifician can be interpreted as a philosophical treatment of the six days of creation, followed by the eschatological seventh uh, day of rest. Oh, by the way, just a side note, in case some of you don't know, uh, Dumbarton Oaks just reprinted Erugian's Perifician in Sheldon Williams and Omira's translation, making its purchasing available once again, something that to be honest was so necessary since it was really difficult for me to, to access to the English text during the pandemic, just so you know. <laughs> so, the structure of the talk will be the following. First, I will define the main features of the theory of causa essentialis, and I'm going to show its presence in Eugenia. Then I will present Erugina's doctrine of apocatastasis. And finally, I, will, I shall argue that Erugina's apocatastasis doctrine relies strongly eh, on the basis provided by the theory of causa essentialis, without which it could not be fully understood. <laughs> so I am pretty sure that most of you are familiar with uh, the theory of causa essentialis since it appears in the work of Bertolt of Mosburg, an author that, unlike me, most of you know very well. Um, but allow me to do a brief presentation about the topic. Um, for this purpose, I am going to use a line deliverer's definition of causa essentialis. Uh, now you're going to see the French text in my PowerPoint. 
and I'm going to present only the domain ideas. So there is a text. As a summary, Alan the Liberal says, uh, one, the medieval theory of causa essentialis is a theory of the intellectual causality that cannot be embraced by the Aristotelian four causes scheme. Two, the expression was introduced by Albert the Great, so in the 13th century. And three, sorry, three, it defines God as an essentially active principle, um, essential principle of all things which acts by its own essence, according to an essential causality and by itself. And four, the essential cause, therefore, has two features or two main features. A, it acts by its own essence, and B, it pre-contains or possesses in itself in advance its effects in an eminent mode. So, um, as the Libera does, the theory of causa essentialis has been uh, associated traditionally with Albert the Great and the Dominican School of Cologne. However, <laughs> In an article published in Quesio, Quesio, sorry, Journal of the History of Metaphysics in 2002, uh, Christoph Erisman shows that, in fact, it is Perugina who should be regarded as the father of the theory of causa essentialis. Um, certainly, as I will show in a second, the expression causa essentialis is employed first by Perugina in the ninth century to talk about God and his creative goodness. Indeed, um, in the Periphysium, in the book five of the Periphysium, I'm oh, sorry, book second of the Periphysium, uh, Regina calls God causa essentialis, um, especially in 590 AD and 599A. Um, so, as a general rule in this presentation, when uh, quoting a passage from Eugenia's work, I will read or paraphrase the text in English, but you will have available the Latin text in these slides, so you can confront it. So, this is the passage. This is book two, 598 D, 599 A. <laughs> so, this is the passage. Uh, so, in the matter of the most high and unique cause of all things, from which and in which the beginnings of the whole creation, that is, the primordial causes, both are and have been created, I think it, might, it must be asked whether, being unity and trinity, it has within itself the causes differentiated from one another, that is, whether, as there is predicated of it one essence in three substances, so also it is to believe and understood that there is one essential cause in three subsistent causes and three subsistent causes in one essential cause. Um, shortly after, Eugenia calls God causa essentialis again in the context of, the, of an explanation of the Trinity. And this happens in Perifision book two again, but, but 600 B. <laughs> so the text says, there is then a substantial cause which is unbegotten and begets, and there is a substantial cause which is begotten and does not beget, and also there is a substantial cause which proceeds and is not unbegotten, nor begotten, nor begetting. And the three substantial causes are one and one essential cause. <laughs> The notion of cause is at the core of uh, Erogenous philosophical system. Uh, as it is known, his famous quadripartite division of nature, physis, is based on it. So, in this sense, we have the first nature, the one that creates, creates and is not created, which is God as first cause. The second nature, the one that is created and creates, which are the divine ideas, um, the third nature, the one that is created and does not create, which are the effects of the ideas, limited in time and space. And the fourth nature, the one that is not created nor creates, 
which is God as supreme in end. So um, at this point, uh, I think it's convenient to uh, remember, well, as you well know, that uh, in Medivania Platonism in general, they, the paradigmatic scheme that they, uh, which, by which the causal procession of the universe is explained is that of exitus and reditus, uh, which is uh, related to the triadic structure, monet, prodos, epistrophe, permanence, procession, return. So accordingly, um, the Christian thinkers of this tradition associated the doctrine of creation and therefore divine causality with this cosmic circular movement of procession and return. In this sense, and this is very important for my exposition, um, for Eugenia, uh, everything comes from God, and in the end, everything will go back to him. Everything is from him, in him, and for him. Erisman argues that Eugenia borrows this from the Neoplatonic tradition that precedes him as Proclus already provided uh, explicit formulations of this thesis. For instance, uh, um, elements of theology, well, sorry, Thanos, <laughs> elements of theology, um, Proposition 31, it says that all that proceeds from any principle reverts in respect of its being upon that from which it proceeds. And then again, in elements of theology, Proposition 35, he says that every effect remains in its cause, proceeds from it, and reverts upon it. Um, this, however, doesn't mean that original red proclus in the original or directly, uh, though I think Thierry suggested uh, it, but this only means that he received his influence through his Greek Neoplatonic uh, readings especially the Pseudo-Dionysius, especially the Pseudo-Dionysius. Um, by the way, I just mentioned this because I encountered this topic this week, or last week. Um, I just read a very interesting paper by Carlo Matsuki, where he argues, uh, he argues sorry, that the real author of the Corpus Dionysiacum in general was the Matius. So I didn't know about this. Uh, and I thought it would be worthy of mention, just because. So I will go back to that, that topic. So, so, so soon, soon we will have Ishvan Persel giving a paper uh, in our seminar, and uh, I think he will have something different to say about that. But uh, <laughs> I just don't want it's to spoil it, it, it's a very conclusions. Yeah, it's a very interesting. It was a very interesting paper, and, and he was really firm in his position. So uh, I just thought it was worth mention. To be honest, I don't know how to. I, I'm not in position to analyze what he says. So I just, I just want to mention because it, I thought it was interesting, and I knew that some of you could have something to say about it. So coming back uh, to my exposition. So we have found, as I hope. Uh, it's clear that the term causa essentialis referred to God as cause in Eugenia. But what about uh, the main features that the expression bears for Abel the Great and his followers? So let's see. Um, the first feature, as you can see, uh, of the essential cause is that it acts by its own essence. So according to Arisman, again, Eugenia takes this first characteristic from the Pseudo-Dionysius, who in turn takes the formula of causality by the very being from Proclus. Um, in what sense uh, this uh, is present in Eugenia? Well, for Eugenia, the very being of God implies creation. <laughs> God's being and his creative action are one and the same property. Um, this is exposed, for instance, in Perifisium Book 1, 518a. Uh, uh, so this is the passage. <laughs> so well, I, I'm pretty sure that you already know this, but let's not forget that the Perifisium is a monumental dialogue between Magister or Nutritor and an alumnus. 
So the nutritor says, are God and his making, that is his action, two things or one simple and indivisible thing? And the student replies, I see that they are one, for God does not admit number in himself, since he alone is innumerable and number without number, and the cause of all numbers which surpasses every number. And now the nutritor, therefore, it is not one thing for God to be and another to make, but for him being is the same as making, and the alumno says, I dare not resist this conclusion. For Irina, as well as for Proclus before, although I will not comment on this because I don't know too much about Proclus, uh, God's mind is where creation takes place. And I, as of Proclus, I think he talks about the demiurge, but again, I, I won't talk about it. So uh, God's thoughts, uh, the primordial causes, uh, constitute the created intelligible world that is deposited in his logos. For instance, let's see this text of Eugenia's uh, homily on the prologue to the Gospel of St. John. This uh, beautiful treatise was written by Eugenia before we lost his trace, and it's one that, in my opinion, does not uh, receive enough attention as it should. Um, the homily is Eugenia's most mature text, uh, but sometimes it has been interpreted uh, as a mere abridgment of his thought. Uh, but I think it's much more, much more than that. Um, as a homily, it is a discourse written to impress its audience, in which Eugenia is, as Omera said, holy in it, as he is holy in a prevision also differently. This works, uh, this work, sorry, constitutes uh, a privileged place from where it is possible to acquire a better understanding of some of the main doctrines of Virginia, and a text, that, a, a text that I have personally found very useful during my studies. So this is what it says in the seventh uh, chapter of the Amelie. All things were made through him, through God the Word himself, through the very God Word, all things were made. And what does all things were made through him mean, if not that as the Word was before, was born before all things from the Father, all things were made with him and by him? For the generation of the Word from the Father is the very creation itself of all causes together with the operation and effect of all that proceeds from them in kinds and species. Truly, all things were made from the generation of the God, the world, from the God, the beginning. Here then, the divine and ineffable paradox, the unopenable secret, the invisible depth, the incomprehensible mystery. Through him who was not made but begotten, all things were made but not begotten. In the book two of the Revision, especially in 529b, Eugenia says that the divine ideas, also known as primordial exemplars um, or predestinations, are the species or forms in which the unchanging constitutive reasons of all the created world were made. They are immutable because God, the Father, performed them in his Son, that is, in, his, in the Logos. So the relationship between the Logos and its, its ideas in Regina is a very interesting topic. Um, with Regina, we have this characteristic notion of divine ideas as creatures, although are they really creatures in the strict sense of, sense of the word? I will not go. I will go. I will not go further in this point. But it's a really interesting topic because I have found very different opinions about it. So, God's, create, God's creative operation is a result of His own being, which in Him are identical. Furthermore, as we just saw, 
Erigena says that the generation of the world, the Logos, which is God himself, uh, from the Father, is not other than the very creation itself. Therefore, we have found the first characteristic of causa essentialis, to act by its own. Creation, uh, therefore, does uh, seem to be necessary because it pertains to God's essence. This doesn't mean, or I think that uh, I don't think so, uh, that a creature is necessary in itself. So when uh, talking about this with Professor Marenborn, he mentioned the, uh, the resemblance that it could have with Avicenna's theory about the necess necessary being. Uh, but well, I just I, I won't go further than this point. So the second feature of the essential cause um, was uh, it precontains or possesses in advance in itself its effects in an eminent mode. So uh, this idea is all over the erogenous work. Um, for instance, let's read the following passage from the second book of the Periphysion, 547a. Uh, so here it says, for the cause, if it be truly cause, most perfectly pre-encompasses in itself all things of which it is the cause and perfects in itself its effects before they become manifest in anything. And when they break forth through generation into genera and visible species, they do not abandon their perfection in it, but fully and immutable abide in it, and need no other perfection than it alone, in which they subsist all at once and eternally. So it is important to notice that uh, Erugina in some way adopts the Plotinian postulate that only intelligible principles or forms are real causes, meaning in this case God and his ideas. Therefore, material bodies cannot be the cause of anything. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting some water. So for Erugina, as he exposes in the seventh chapter of his homily, nothing was made without and outside the Logos, <laughs> because it uh, circumscribes and comprehends all, and nothing can be conceived that is co-eternal, consubstantial, or co-essential with, with him, except the Father and the Spirit that proceeds from the Father through the Logos. So immediately, Erigena adds a comparison between the Greek and the Latin terms that are employed to describe the relationship between the Logos and, and the creation that takes place through him, stating, of course, the superiority of the Greek terminology, since it conveys better the idea that all creation takes place within the Logos. So this is what Erigena says and seventh chapter of the homily or homily so this is easier understood in greek for where the latin says sine ipso without him the greek says codis auto that is outside him for this reason i said i say that the greek is more easily understood because one who hears sine ipso can still think without his help or counsel thereby attributing to him neither the totality nor all things. Understanding Coris as outside, however, leaves nothing whatsoever that is not made uh, in and through him. So, for all the above, Erisman doesn't hesitate on calling Erigena the father of the theory of causes essentialis, and as I hope to have shown, it seems so. So now let's look uh, at the Erigenian doctrine of apocatastasis. Um, for this, I will employ the definition provided by Ilaria Ramelli, or Ramelli, 
in her masterpiece, The Christian Doctrine of Apocatastasis, a critical assessment from the New Testament to Eriogena. Um, to really, if you're interested in the topic, you should read it because it is a truly monumental work and provides uh, an extended revision of primary sources in Greek, Latin, and even Syriac and Coptic, I think. I'm a big fan of Professor Ramirez's work. So, well, she says this. <laughs> the noun apocatastasis related to the verb apocathistemi, I restore, I reintegrate, reconstitute, return, bears a fundamental meaning of restoration, reintegration, reconstitution. This term had a variety of applications in antiquity. But as a Christian and late antique philosophical doctrine to be found also in Paranoplatonism, for instance, in Macrobius, it came to indicate the theory of universal restoration, that is, of the return of all beings, or at least all rational beings, or all humans, to the good, namely God in the end. As it happened with the origins of the theory of causa essentialis, the origin of the doctrine of hypocatastasis has been uh, misattributed for a long time. Um, traditionally, origin of Alexandria is credited uh, with being the founder of this doctrine in Christianity. But as Professor, as Professor Ramelis shows, uh, in reality, he had several antecedents. Um, in fact, or at least this is what Professor Ramelis argues, um, this doctrine was abundantly received through the throughout the patristic era up to the one uh, who can be regarded as the last of the fathers, John Scotus Eugena. <laughs> so, as it was already mentioned, Eugena conceives the relationship between the cause and its effect following the scheme, the scheme of exitus and reditus. Um, the capital importance of this uh, to Eugena can be appreciated easily from the very first pages of the Perifician. Um, not only that treatise itself reproduces that scheme in its composition, since uh, the book starts with an explanation of the procession to finalize or to end with the return of all the creation to its causes, but also this is reflected in the quadruple division that affects the, to the most important notion of the Carolingian master. Uh, that of nature. Certainly, uh, the natura qua creat et non creatur is God as principle, as first cause of the entire reality, while the last one, the natura qua ne creat ne creatur, is God as supreme end. So, um, this makes evident that the quadruple division of nature does not correspond to four different ontological levels but uh, that is said in reference to what is created, since the first and the fourth form represent um, the most simple reality, which is, which is God. This can be seen in Perifician Book 2, 527D, 28D. So here it says, for these two forms are discerned not in God, but in our contemplation of him, and are not forms of God, but of our reason, resulting from our double consideration of him as beginning and end. Nor is it in God that they are reduced to form, but in our contemplation, which, in considering the beginning and the end, creates in itself, as it were, two forms of contemplation. And this again, it would seem, it reduces into a single form of contemplation, when it begins to consider the simple unity of a divine nature. For beginning and end are not proper names of the divine nature, but of its relation to the things which are created. Um, thus, um, for the original system, uh, is epistemology uh, what defines the perspective in metaphysics, and not, on, not the other way around. Um, Hence, the per exitus reditus should not be seen as independent and separated processes, since both movements appear linked in the human mind that reflects upon them. 
So um, reality is first created by God in an intelligible way. So this is a stage where the primordial causes remain in God as divine ideas. After it uh, comes the procession of the sensible world uh, that Erogena attributes to an initial or, or origin, uh, original transgression. And finally, all of the reality, intelligible and sensible, will move towards God, the supreme final cause. As Stephen, uh, Stephen Gersh pointed out, the reditus or return uh, represents the state in which an effect after the procession makes an effort to get a union and connection with its cause. And this is what makes the effect to convert to it. Um, in the case of Erugina, the last great uh, scene of the cosmic drama is understood in terms of apocatastasis, which is a specific mode of understanding the return characterized by the reconstitution of all creatures without exception to God. So in this way, God will be all in all, which is a phrase that the region repeats a lot. So the theory of catastasis appears clearly in the Prefision uh, all over, but uh, there are already some glimpses of it, or at least uh, of some of his elements in his first treatise, which is also of eschatological nature, um, the Divina Predestinatione Liber, or the Predestinatione. Uh, <clears throat> so in this controversial, controversial text, Erugina holds against Goshkalk of Urbais that there is no double predestination at Pitam and at Mortem. That is, God has not predestined a paterno, some to salvation, and others to damnation. On the contrary, it must be affirmed that by virtue of a full identification between God and the supreme good, only one predestination exists, predestination to salvation. So this is what the Regina says regarding the impossibility of a twofold predestination in the epilogue of his treatise. So he says, I anathematize those who say that there are two predestinations, or one which is twin, or in two parts, or double. For if there are two, it is not one divine substance. If twin, it is not indivisible. If two parts, it is not simple, but composed of parts. If double, it is multiple. And if we are forbidden to call a divine unity triple, by what kind of madness does the heretic dare to call it double? So, okay, there's a protestasis in Regina, but how does it take place according to him? Well, Regina describes the stages of apocatastasis, especially in the book five of his Perifician. For instance, here in book five, 876a, 876b, Erugina talks about five different returns or stage, stages of the return. So first, the first return of human nature is a dissolution of the body and its return to the four elements of the sensible world. Second return will be the moment of resurrection when each human will receive its own body due to the union of the, from, the aforementioned four elements. The third return is the transformation of the corporal body to spirit. The fourth return will take place when all human nature returns to the primordial causes that are eternally an immutable manner in God. The fifth return will take place when the entire nature with all its causes, moves within God as the air moves within the light, says Erogena. In the final return, Erogena continues, God will be all in all. There will, be no, any, there will not be anything that is not God. Erogena says, edit, enis, edit enim deus omnia in omnibus, quando nihil edit nisi solus deus. 
However, and Regina has really, really uh, insisted a lot in this, this doesn't mean that the substances of the creatures will be banished. But the contrary, it will be upgraded in each stage. Therefore, the transformation of human nature into God is not the destruction of its substance, but the wonderful and ineffable return, says Regina, to the pristine state that it had lost. In Prefision, Book 5 again, but in this case, 893C, 894A, Regina presents the stages of the return, but in a somewhat different way, a more mystical one, if you wish. So the first, re the first return starts with the unification of the sexual gender in humans, something that will take place in the moment of the resurrection. Thus, human nature will be unified. In a second return, the orbs of Earth will join paradise, and there will be only paradise. In here, we must understand uh, paradise as the restored human nature, which has recuper recuperated um, its original condition. In the third return, Earth and Heaven will be reunited, and there will be only Heaven. After that, it follows the unification of all sensible and intelligible creation, and there will be only an intelligible world. And finally, all the universal creation will unite to God and will be one thing in him and with him. This is the telos, the end of all things, visible and invisible ones, um, because all visible things will become intelligible and all intelligible things will become God through an ineffable unification, says Eugen. But this not because of the destruction of the created substances. What is interesting um, about this second passage that I just paraphrased is that um, in the middle of it, Regina presents the idea that the successive returns take place in such a way that it is always the case that the lower degree moves towards the upper one. Indeed, Regina says, for instance, uh, that if sexual gender moves towards man, meaning human nature, it is because sexual gender is inferior to it. So in the same manner, if terrestrial orbs move towards paradise, it is because paradise is superior and so on. So I'm gonna do a re brief recapitulation. So according to the previous passages to both of them, the stages of apocatastasis uh, are the following. Uh, of, uh, we shouldn't understand these stages, of course, as, a, as developing in a chronological order, right? but these are the stages to... Uh, this is the way that he structures it to, to make it understandable. So first, everything starts with human death, which is the dissolution of the corporal body into the four elements. Then human resurrection occurs, which is the constitution or reconstitution of the body from the four elements, but with no gender distinction. After it, the human corporal body gets transformed into spirit, recovering its condition before the falling. This is followed by the entire material world returning to its causes within human nature. Then human nature returns to the primordial causes. And finally, the primordial causes and with them all creation return to God. And then God will be all in all. So the question now is, what does this have anything to do with the theory of cause essentialis? Well, the, what I mm, want to argue today is that everything. So, in, 
uh, the book five of the Prefision in 879a, uh, Erjuna gives us uh, an explanation of the movement, return of the rational substances to God, where all things will reach their telos and will be one with him. So God, as I already said many times, will be all in all. Um, so here um, he states that this happens because inferior things are naturally attracted to and absorbed by the superior ones and highlights the fact that it could not be the other way around. What is superior, Erjuna says, is not attracted by the inferior nor consumed by it. And why is this? Because it is not the inferior what contains the superior, but the superior what contains the inferior. Again, the conversion of the inferior to the superior, it is not for the inferior to be banished, but for it to subsist in a better state, to be one with the superior. That is to say, uh, Irina says a lot, to be safe. Thus, um, the, mov the, the movement of the conversion of the inferior to the superior obvious to the fact that the superior contains in it what is inferior. Um, however, something can contain other things in many ways. You know, for instance, let's think about uh, the way that glass contains water. You know, the glass truly contains the water, but we wouldn't say that the water is naturally attracted to the glass or there is a metaphysical necessity in the relation. Um, so in this sense, Erjuna insists on talking about the movement of the inferior towards the superior in terms of return, as we have seen. So this return is the cosmological reditus, which for Erjuna coincides with apocatastasis. But if Erjuna talks about return, then he is referring to a restitution of a condition that is original and natural for the things that are returning, a condition that they had and they lost. If not, we wouldn't be able to talk about a return. Um, therefore, Erugina, sorry, when Erugina says that the superior attracts and absorbs the inferior because the former contains the latter, he's saying that what is superior pre-contains the inferior. And this is what, uh, as we saw, uh, was among the main features of the essential cause. So also, according to the theory of causa essentialis, uh, the cause pre-contains the effect, but in an eminent way. way. Erujina defends the ontological and axiological primacy of the cause over its effects. Therefore, the effect has to come back to its cause, which is superior, because it is within the cause when the effect is more real, more authentic. So in relation to apocatastasis, um, Erugina insists everywhere in that the return of the creation is to a better state that it had within its cause, but that was, the, but that was lost. So um, as we remember, all creation was made through the divine ideas that are contained in the logos and thus all creation will return to it. In this sense, Erjuna refers to the state of the created reality determined by time and space, which means the effect, uh, but the effect within the Logos, he talks about uh, in terms of life, while calling death to the state of the effects outside its cause. Let's see, for instance, this text uh, again with, uh, inside the or within the homily. This is the chapter nine, when Erujana calls life to the state of the effect within its cause. So a little, a little longer, but I'm gonna read it. Um, so earlier he said all things were made by him, and then what was made in him was life. This last sentence is ambiguous and may be spoken in two ways. For either one says, 
what was made adding in him was life, or one says what was made in him and that adds was life. To these two punctuations, two different meanings are given to us for contemplation. For the contemplation that asserts what was made in places, discrete times, kinds, form, forms, and distinct numbers, whether of sensible or intellectual substance, compact or separated, all this was life in him. This is not the same as the one that declares what was made in him is not other than life. Let our meaning therefore be the following, says Eugenia. All things that are made in him, in him are life and are one. All things where subsist in him as causes before they are in themselves as effects. For the things that are made through him are beneath him in one way, and the things that he is are in him in another. As opposed to this, in, again, in the prologue to the Gospel of St. John, but in this case, chapter uh, 17, Erigina reflects upon the meaning of John uh, 1, 9, that proclaims, that was the true light which I said every man that cometh into the world. But Erigina asks, from where do human beings come into the world? And into what world they come? And for this, Erigina says, and, you know, it's clearly referring to the exit of the effect from the cause. And Erigina says, um, and if those are men who come into this world from the hidden faults of nature through generation in times and places, then what sort of illumination is possible for them in this life where we are born to die, grow but to decay, coagulate but to be dissolved again, falling from the restfulness of silent nature into the restlessness of bustling misery? Tell me please what kind of spiritual and true light there is for those procreated in a transitory and false life? Is not precisely this world a fit dwelling for those alienated from the true light? Is it not justly called the region of the shadow of death, the valley of tears, the eyes of ignorance, the early, early habitation that weighs down the human soul and expels the true beholding of the light from the inner eyes? In the following passages, Irina says that the state of the effects, once they have left their cause and are bound to time and space, is dead. And therefore, the authentic meaning of the phrase, which like dead every man that commit into the world, cannot therefore refer to those men who proceed from hidden seminal causes into corporeal species. Rather, it must refer to those who, by the spiritual regeneration to grace that is given in baptism, enter the invisible world. Again, you know, the idea that um, uh, something that ha it had, but then lost, uh, and uh, the idea of regeneration. Um, and Irina continues, rejecting the beard, the birth, sorry, according to the corruptible body, this shows the second birth which is spiritual. Again, in this case appears the, the idea of the transformation of the corporeal realm to the spiritual one. They, Regula continues, treat underfoot the world that is below and ascend to the world that is above. Again, the idea of the superior and inferior and the movement that uh, the inferior real uh, do uh, does towards the superior because it's attracted to it. Uh, continue. Leaving behind the shadows of ignorance and death, they yearn for the light of wisdom and life, which corresponds to the state outside the cause, the cause, and then, you know, the return to it, respectively. Uh, so, we can see how in these last two long passages that I just quote from Eugenia's homily, all these ideas appear. Everything was created within the logos. The effects were pre-contained in the cause in an eminent mode, 
one of the main features of the, cost, the essential cost. Indeed, all things subsist first and foremost in their causes, which are deposited in the logos, which is understood as life, before that they are in themselves as effects in time and places, a state that is understood as death. So all of this is treated in an eschatological framework in the original exegesis of which I fed every man that commits that commit into the world. That is referring, according to him, to the restoration of men to the intelligible causes from which they proceeded or fell into corporeal bodies. Um, well, it's interesting to know that, you know, the uh, Eugenius homily had a wide present, presence in medieval libraries because it was wrongly attributed to origin of Alexandria, to whom the doctrine of apocatastasis is usually associated with. Um, the ideas regarding the return are all over this work, and therefore such a misattribution seems reasonable. It should be noticed that the other main feature of the essential cause, that is, that it acts by its own essence, it is implied in what uh, was just exposed. Indeed, uh, if you remember, for Eugenia, the very being of God implies creation. God's being and his creative action are one and the same property. The essential causality explains the origin of the creatures in the primordial causes contained in the logos, which is God's sapientia or wisdom. But the same essential causality explains then the return. Because in the same way that God is first caused by his own essence, which makes him create, by his own essence is the supreme end that attracts everything to him and thus, and thus sorry, makes him not to create according to the fourth nature. So this is exposed, for instance, in Perificium Book 5, uh, 1019b, 1019c. He says, when all things which have proceeded from it, either through intelligible or sensible generation, shall by a miraculous and ineffable rebirth return to it, when all things have found their rest in it, when nothing more shall flow forth from it into generation, it can no longer be said of it that it creates anything. For what should it for what should it be creating when it itself shall be all in all and shall manifest in itself in nothing set sorry what Sorry, for what should it be creating when it itself shall be all in all, as shall manifest itself in nothing save itself? So, in this sense, um, the knowledge that through his wisdom goes, God possesses is ontological superior to the entities that belong to the realm of the third nature namely the effects of the ideas that lack creative power. Uh, um, accordingly, the things that are affected by time and space are more real when they are not in that state, that is, when they are contained in a divine a thought and its ideas. Therefore, the deepest truth of each creative thing consists in the correspondent idea, its eternal and immutable substance, which lies within the virtus gnostica which is a divine creative knowledge. Therefore, apocatastasis is not the elimination of the creature, and even less its diminishment, as we can see in Book 1 of the Perifision, 451D, 452A. And here, Arjuna says, the reform, he is the beginning, the middle, and the end. The beginning, because from him, are all things that participate in essence. The middle, because in him and through him they subsist and move. The end, because it is towards him that they move in seeking rest from their movement and the stability of their perfection. In this respect, it is also um, indicative regarding the relationship between the theory of causa essentialis and the doctrine of catastasis. The fact that uh, for Eugenia, both are based not simply on God, but on God's bonitas or goodness. Um, 
Certainly, in, in Prefusion Book 3, 627D, Eugenia calls specifically God's bonitas causa essentialis. So it says, for it is property of the divine goodness to call the things that were not into existence. For the divine goodness and more than goodness is both, an essential, is both the essential and super essential cause of the universe that it has established and brought to essence. And in Perifician Book 5, 953b, Erwin speaks uh, of God's bonitas as the agent of apocatastasis. Indeed, he says that uh, the return, which is apocatastasis, needs to take place because it would not be convenient to God's bonitas that his image remains in the eternal death. Um, therefore, as I hope to have shown in Erugina, the theory of, of causa essentialis not only explains that procession of creatures from God, but also the return to them of them to him, the so-called apocatastasis. Um, indeed, as I have said, the essential cause is not only first cause, but also the supreme end or final cause. Um, when speaking about the final relatives of creatures, Irugina uses the expression occultissima operatio, a mysterious operation. I think that having in mind the metaphysical framework that is provided by the theory of causa essentialis allows unveiling in some extent this mystery and provides a better understanding of Irugina's conception of catastasis, uh, shedding some light into its most problematic features like, for instance, the universality of apocatastasis that includes the return of the devil himself, since his true nature is in God's mind, therefore it has to return, um, that there are no eternal punishments, since at the end, all that does not belong to, God, in God, to God's mind will not return to it. Uh, the no uh, ontological nature of evil, since evil doesn't have a cause in God's mind, and so on. So thank you. <laughs>